Hi, I'm Keith Bradbury of Mojo Mouthpiece Work. Um, for years I've been primarily a saxophone player, but I double on flute and clarinet. I play a lot, I have played a lot of barry sax, and uh, it calls for doubling on bass clarinet, which I've done for years, either in a big band setting or in a high school pit orchestra for high school musical. In the past year uh, or so, I've been uh, focusing mostly on bass clarinet, and I upgraded my, my old e, low E flat, old Normandy uh, bass clarinet that served me well to a Kessler low C bass clarinet. It's uh, made out of, they say, hard rubber. It's a hard rubber plastic blend, I think, but uh, because it's not wood, you don't have to spend ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 for one. This is uh, $2,000 and change, and uh, it's a lot of fun to play. I want to show you some uh, mouthpiece issues that can come up with choosing a good setup for bass clarinet. On here I have a Bay MOM. Uh, there's several different eras of that. This one doesn't have a lot of engraving or gold uh, uh, inlay on it. Um, when I get down to the workbench you'll see what more what it looks like, but it has a nice facing on it and uh, has a kind of a duck bill uh, bite, very comfortable, and I've used this for, I don't know, 20 years off and on. I really like it. And on here, I've matched it with a uh, Legere, or Legere, depending on how you pronounce that, plastic reed. It's a actually a tenor sax reed, a studio cut, which they don't sell for the bass clarinet. They only sell the regular cut. It's the same, uh, you know, punch out for, for the uh, shape on it. So I like the studio on this mouthpiece. Uh, it's a two and three quarter strength. So I like using a little vibrato which uh, comes from my big band experience. Um, so, this works real nice for me. I have another mouthpiece here, which I've used prior to this one, and I've uh, held on to it as a backup. It's a Van Doren. This one's a B445. Uh, a little bit less of a tip opening. I believe this has an 82 on it, 80-82. Uh, 082 inches. I don't you know, you have to convert the millimeters if you want to do that in millimeters. I think it's about two millimeters. This one's a little closer at about, I, I marked them on here, 075, 0.075 inches. Um, I can use the same read on here, though it may actually, I have a backup read for this one that's a little stiffer than I like. And this is a regular cut. Legere, two and a half, two and a half, two and a quarter of a regular cut matches the two and three quarter of the studio. Now, don't ask me why they're not consistent. So, let's, and the other thing that I've done on this mouthpiece, which I'll show you more on the workbench, is I have a power tone baffle put in there. It's a mild hump shape, uh, adhesive. Uh, holds it in place. I don't want to peel it out because uh, then I'll have to figure out how to glue it back in. They're not sold anymore under that name, but they are sold under the Hot Sax name. And um, the shape of the Van Doren baffle without it is a little concave, whereas the Bay is a straight baffle. Other than that, they're both very similar inside. The undercutting's a little different under here. And they have different facing curves on them, which I'll show you later. So what this allows me to do is compensate for that concave baffle, which is a little too dark for my tastes and my needs. So that's why that's in there. <laughs> Good, I would.
would have no problem playing that. Um, it's a little brighter to the point where uh, uh, I haven't adjusted my embouchure enough to compensate for it. It kind of you know wants to bark or you know chirp a little more. So voicing is so important on bass clarinet. The um, last mouthpiece that I want to show you is a no-name stock mouthpiece that came with the bass clarinet that I kind of threw in the closet and until now didn't do anything with. Um, it has a very different um, facing curve on it and it's also a different shape inside. The, um, and I'll show you more of that on the workbench. But uh, first time I, I played it preparing for this video I thought it was unplayable. In fact, I'll, I'll put my uh, two and a quarter studio read on here and show you what I experienced initially. Very stuffy, very resistant. I'm, uh, it takes a lot of effort for me to play it that much. Um, so I said, oh, this is a goner, but I have to change the facing, da 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 da, because that's what I do. But then I said, well, it's unfair to audition a mouthpiece with the same read you use all the time, because it may work better with a different read. And it's hard to keep an inventory of lots of different reads. But I went through what I had. I mostly have synthetics. Um, and I ended up with an old medium soft fi fiber cell. I have a couple of these for my tenor sax. Um, and this one is better than the other medium softs I have, so they're not even all consistent. But what I've noticed about medium soft, I mean about fiber cell reeds, is they have a very long, um, you know, vamp, very uh, uh, long cut so that they can start bending sooner. If you have a long facing mouthpiece, which this happens to be, so it starts very long, this will allow the reed to start bending where the facing starts to bend. And that was the problem with this other reed. Uh, I believe air was leaking out the sides essentially. Um, the other thing this has is even though it's a long facing, if the rest of the curve was nice and gentle, it would just blow very easily, but it's not. It has a long facing, then it has a very tight curve up here, giving it a lot of resistance. So you kind of have uh, two differences there that I'll, I'll show you on the workbench. <laughs> piece went from virtually unusable to, to something I, if I had to, I could play on this uh, for a concert or whatever. So that's how important it is to match up a read. And some mouthpieces, uh, you won't have a read for them. There may be one out there or they may be just that bad. But So this one's uh, pretty decent. I still prefer, in general, the sound of uh, the Legere. And uh, I'll show you, uh, I guess my goal is to make a backup to my bay mouthpiece out of this mouthpiece. So it's going to be a project. And I'll change the facing first and see how it agrees with my read. And then I'll see if I want to change the inside, how important that is uh, to get the tone I want, and whether or not I, uh, I'll probably duck bill the top too, though I could get used to that. <laughs> Now I'm going to compare these bass clarinet mouthpieces dimensionally and make a few comments on them. First, what I usually do is take a number of body measurements. I don't do a lot with with them, but uh, I do record them on my spreadsheet. I do things like uh, you know the the bore and the, the overall length. Uh, the window length, the window width. Um, I don't take too much on the body around this way, but you could. You know, that's just what I uh, wanted to record. And, um, you know, some thicknesses of the tip. Um, I try to actually get inside 
this is interesting and take some of these inside um, telescoping uh, board gauge board gauges I guess is what you call them uh, they're not really gauges because you got to use it with the caliper but you, you, you can pick a point let's say where the window ends all the way at the bottom and they're spring loaded and then you twist the end and you can pull out and get a width off of these at the you know how wide the chamber is at that point and you can do the same thing up top or you can just go up top and measure the top with calipers um, the um, that's significant in that they're different on these three mouthpieces the bay and the Van Doren both have what I'll call an A chamber um, if it's you hold it this way you could call it a V chamber uh, but with the facing up the the side walls are tapered like this and they're, they're pretty pretty much the same um, I've measured them dimensionally now this a uh, stock mouthpiece that came with my Kessler um, does not. It has what I would call a uh, kind of a barrel shaped, you know, it's fairly straight but in, but when you look at it the sides might be slightly bowed out like this in the middle but it's definitely a different shape than what we have going on here. Um, it's a bit shiny on the inside so it's it's hard to show that but um, I'll take a shot at it you know, try to hold it up to the camera and uh, you know, show the light inside. Whereas the bay and the uh, Van Doren, you know, being how they're, it's not quite as shiny, it's easier to see. So what does that mean? I don't know. It's a difference. Uh, it makes the chamber volume a little larger. Um, but there's, it, it, it may not be a huge difference. In fact, I did do some um, uh, volume measurements using water on these just to uh, satisfy my own curiosity. I use a graduated cylinder. I tape the, uh, the facing shut, and then I fill it up with water. Then I dump it into a, a cylinder and measure how much water comes out. Do it a number of times. Uh, I'm not a chemist, so you know the, 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 the readings vary, and I don't always dry the mouthpiece off, but um, what I got though was uh, that the uh, bay was at, uh, the bay, shake this one, was at about 27 milliliters, and this was at like 26 and a half, so they're pretty darn close, but the, uh, the stock mouthpiece was a little smaller, so if I wanted to get in there and hog out the sides a little to make it like that I could and it probably won't throw the intonation off it'll probably make it more similar um, uh, there's also probably some backboard differences I didn't measure them and record them but um, if you're concerned you can sometimes get a feel for that by dropping your your uh, the probe of your calipers down along the sides until it catches where the backboard ends and you can, you can get a reading on that that says two uh, and eight thousands. That says one point eight seven seven. So, even though the chamber is smaller in the throat area on this one, it's got a longer backboard, and that probably compensates some, so that you end up with a similar volume between both of these. So, um, the. Uh, where things get really interesting is when we compare the facings on these, because that's really the main focus of what I want to show. And uh, the, the, the way I measure facing, the way refacers measure facings, is they have a glass gauge that's graduated. Um, the most common one in use is graduated in increments that are two times mill, mill, millimeters, so a 10 from the tip opening, you zero the gauge on the tip, and a 10 would indicate 5 millimeters away from the uh, tip. I have a whole another video on uh, uh, feeler gauges and gauge systems and explains you know, why that is. Uh, but that's a standard of what's used in the uh, refacing industry. Um, and let me
let me get my light up here a little better. The um, facing is then measured by zeroing the tip on this graduated gauge. Then you drop in feeler gauges of various thickness, starting with this very thin one, 0 0.015 thousandths of an inch. It's very thin. And you drop this down, and it slides until it hits resistance. And you learn to get a feel for this so you're not jamming one side and not the other. And this is what we call the facing length, and it's the first point uh, that we read. And on here, it's pretty close to an even 48 across the glass gauge. So it's 25, 24 millimeters from the tip. I, I would just record this as 48 on the left and 48.1 on the right. It has just a slight tilt to it. And uh, then you drop in another feeler, something that's a little thicker, and it rides up. The next one, it's 5 thousandths thick, comes up to where it's like 41.8 on the left and 41.9 on the right. I split hairs. Most refacers read this gauge to the nearest whole number, half or quarter. Um, I like to go down to point 0.1. I've trained my eyes to use the gauge like that, but you don't have to uh, be that fine to do good work. It's just something that I, I like to do. Um, and what we're doing with all these feeler gauges is we're generating XY data. Uh, for those who know, you know, some mathematics, you know, the zero point is here. The uh, feeler gauge gives a drop down, and the gauge, uh, glass gauge, gives a, uh, a distance over. So you have a series of points that you're measuring on the facing curve, and. Um, I'll show you what that looks like now on my PC because as I take these readings I graph them using an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. So what we have here well, up at the top of my spreadsheet that I've set up are all the different body measurements that I take. Um, I also have some text describing uh, what I have here and over to the left is where I put in a starting facing um, for each of the feeler gauges that I use the left and right reading on the gauge and I did this earlier so I'm getting some different numbers depending on how I zeroed it and uh, things of that sort so I actually for this bay I'm showing 48.5 and, and 48.9 so you know sometimes you have to take a few sets of readings to zero in on what it is it's a very sensitive uh, system but anyhow after I get all these put down and then I measure the tip opening which is, and uh, uh, the tip opening and I also measure the thickness of the tip rail um, tip opening I can measure with either a, a dial gauge that I have here or I also use a machinist depth, depth gauge. So what we end up with is a graph of the facing. And this is a graph of the facing exaggerated in this orientation. This is the tip opening, this is the facing length, and this is the curve you know, the read at the table would be up here, your read would be down here, and it would be closing in on this tip. So you can see the tip the way that I do it. Most, and a lot of refacers have adopted the same uh, system, um, you know, is, is very exaggerated open. So all these points on here are the individual feeler gauges, and uh, I actually do plot the left and the right separately. Uh, the, this particular mouthpiece, this bay, is uh, pretty uniform. Um, where it's not uniform, I'll actually try to show uh, an exaggerated, um, you know, uh, uh, illustration of the left and right rail being uh, crooked. This bay is pretty straight, so I'll have to show you that on a different mouthpiece. Um, the other thing I do is, I guess the uh, the dark blue line is just an average 
of the left and right measurement. You know, I have a little key up here. And then I have what is a curve fit that goes through this. And uh, there's a number of different curves you can use. I've settled in to use an elliptical curve fit. Uh, and it also ends up uh, if the aspect ratio of the ellipse is uh, one to one, that's a circle. So the same mathematics works out. So what I've actually fit here is an ellipse, and there's some parameters in here, but the key parameter that I look at is the aspect ratio that best fix, fits this data. In this case, it's a three. So you think of yourself as, uh, think, think of, uh, visualize an ellipse, that this is just a small segment of this ellipse, and that's that ellipse has a major axis that is three times wider, uh, longer than the uh, minor axis. Um, <coughs> I illustrate that uh, again on some of my other videos and, and on my website there's a PowerPoint presentation where I, I show the, uh, the elliptical segment versus a, a radial one and a few other curves. So there's also a slight ripple to this curve, not much. Uh, I would say a slight low spot here, a slight bump there, but this is my favorite mouthpiece so it's pretty good. Um, there may be an issue here. It's usually not a good idea to have a flat, too flat, or, or even a minor concave section uh, at the tip of the mouthpiece. Uh, I've learned that that can affect altissimo, the higher notes. Um, so that's one area that I, uh, the bay is pretty good at, but I might like to experiment to make that better. I'm reluctant to mess with my good mouthpiece and uh, my plan is to copy this facing onto the stock mouthpiece and play with that one. So hopefully you understand that. Let me show you what the Van Doren looks like. So this is the Van Doren and it's a little more crooked back here where it comes off the table um, but it's still it's not bad it plays well at the worst spot I have like uh, here around 30 I get 31.3 versus versus 31.7 so they're you yeah, know that's less than a half on on the gauge and I exaggerate that spot by a factor of 10 using some mathematics um, so if I, it draws my attention that there is a discrepancy there, and when I do some refacing work, um, I can, you know, make adjustments to bring that down. But again, this uh, has a longer facing; it goes all the way out to 54. Um, that's about the max that I'd like to see using a bass clarinet reed. I know from tenor saxophones, which are similar. Uh, cuts not exactly 54 is about the maximum that they like to use on that It'd be really better to be less than that uh, you know because that's pretty much the max and again there's even a more exaggerated low spot there now the third mouthpiece is this stock mouthpiece that came with the Kessler I don't want to call it a Kessler because they really just put a stock mouthpiece in there it's something that's worth like $30 if you, you can find one on eBay. So it has a major, more major, 8 versus 8.7. And it, the, Still, that's not very crooked. Otherwise, it's a pretty uniform mouthpiece. But look back here. The length of it measures at 61 on one side and 62 and a half on the other. Um, yeah, I'll show you what that looks like on the, on the gauge. Let me turn my overhead light on. Put the glass gauge on, try to zero it best I can from this angle so you can see it. Drop in this first feeler. Look at that. It may even be worse than what I measure. Well, I, see, it depends on where I put my thumb pressure too. But uh, I was being kind with it when I took the reading. So. You know, with with that thumb pressure, I'm getting like a 61, maybe a 63. You know, there's a problem here. And uh, if I rock my thumb back a little bit, you know, it wants to drop way down in there. If I rock it forward, it comes up better. So that could be 
you could experience the same kind of variation with how you tighten your ligature and move it back and forth. Uh, so there's an issue here. Um, the other thing I can do is measure the table flatness. I get a little check on it by throwing a, uh, a straight edge on there and looking to see if I see any light coming underneath it. As it turns out, this is pretty flat. Um, so that, that's not the problem. The problem is there's a, a low spot on this side, and it's too long. Um, I think that when I was doing the play test, the Legere reed I was using would not start bending back here, whereas the fiber cell that I finally found would. So if it doesn't bend, you end up getting a leak out there. Small one, but uh, you know that's what kind of the playing it felt like. Like I had a leak on the horn, but I actually had a leak coming out of the mouthpiece, I believe. The other difference is the rest of the curve, after it starts so long, isn't, isn't nice and gentle. It's like long, and then it has a real sudden curve change, and this is a very tight curve, which adds a lot of stuffy resistance. So even though this tip opening is uh, uh, 70 thousandths, um, it, it played with, uh, you know... I needed a, a, a softer read on it than the other two mouthpieces that had more open tips. So let me uh, now overlay all three curves. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, let me get down here. I had put all the data down here in the scratch area. I just have to highlight it. Okay. So. What we have here now is the stock mouthpiece in dark blue. The light blue is the Van Doren B45. And then, I don't know what kind of color you call that. It's almost a uh, peach color, so it doesn't show up that terribly well, um, is the bay. So, the bay mouthpiece is, let me get a pointer. <laughs> the bay mouthpiece is the most open. That's up to, um, let me go actually look at the bay sheet. I measured that at 83 thousandths. Sometimes I measure 84, sometimes 82, but that's 083. That's like 2.1 millimeters. So that's a fairly open bass clarinet mouthpiece. He makes one even long, uh, more open than that, and he makes one that's uh, less, less open than that. So it, it's the middle of his range, but it's the upper end of all the other bass clarinet mouthpieces out there. So... Uh, then there's the Van Doren, and there's the, the, the stock. But look at the curves back here. Um, you know, except for, you know, they, uh, these two de kind of depart here, but look how much different than the stock is. It, uh, you know, it, it has this, you know, major change right across there. So, um, my goal would be to pick the bay as a target, since I like that one, and the Van Doren's not too bad. So something in that ballpark with a shorter facing curve and one that's a little more gentle. Um, you know, the uh, the ellipse on this uh, of the, the best fit, I had to ignore the first data point on the stock mouthpiece and the ellipse of best fit through there is a 10. It says 9.9 .9 on here. You know, that's uh, too much. Um, and the uh, Van Doren had about a 6.6, .6, so I'd call that a 7, um, just to give you an idea. Another difference that um, uh, I had mentioned before, let me move this back down to my workbench. I had mentioned that the beaks were different. The bay is kind of... It, it, we say duck bill just because it's lower, but it's it's doesn't look like a duck in the extreme case it might. But you can see that the uh, the uh, stock mouthpiece is much thicker here, and the Van Doren is something in the middle. And I find both of these fairly comfortable. This one you know, it would take a little more getting used to. Um, I don't have a great way of measuring that, but I do adjust beak profiles for players, but the way that um, I usually get away with uh, measuring it is I, I pick a spot on the mouthpiece, in this case, um, I just want, I, I want I didn't want to peel off these uh, um, uh, patches, 
So I picked a point that's far enough away from the tip. And I, I looked and I said, eh, it looks like 65 on the glass gauge. So I put a, a dot on the side of all three of these mouthpieces where 65 is. Then I took my calipers and I opened them up and I eyeballed where that spot is the best I could. Try to hold it 90 degrees. Now you can see this has a lot of room for error depending on how you uh, hold it, but at least it's a uh, it's a start. You can get a rough idea. I could probably develop a better gauge to uh, measure this with some fixturing, but that's what I did on all three of these mouthpieces. And what I came up with is that the Kessler stock mouthpiece that came with it has got 0.825. And the bay is all the way down to 0 0.715. So that's 110 thousandths difference. What that looks like. Oops. It's about. I'm trying to get That's close enough. It's a little under an eighth of an inch. So that's the difference between, you know, how much this is lowered. And then the uh, Van Doren uh, at 0.7. Eight, five. So it's kind of in the middle, probably a little closer to the stock than it is to the bay. Yeah, but um, yeah, but it's pretty much in the middle. So what I uh, what I, what I would do is uh, I could get away with uh, going to my shaping tools, which I uh, I would start with a belt sander, a little one inch belt sander I have. I could gradually machine sand this and then check my crude rough idea, uh, rough measurement against where, you know, progress. As long as I'm within, you know, ballpark of this one, it'll it'll be more comfortable than it is now. So that's, that's kind of part of my plan after I uh, mess with the facing. So my plan would be to um, take the uh, stock mouthpiece, duplicate the bay facing on it, um, and test it and then see that it plays with my uh, favorite reads and then um, if I feel like it next would be the uh, beak profile and then what I might do is to actually adjust the facing near the tip a little bit maybe make it a little more uh, curved here uh, open the tip just a little bit one, uh, maybe a three, two, three thousandths of an inch, and see how the high note response is. I mostly have a problem at D above the staff. It doesn't want to speak that well, and that's, you know, uh, I'm being picky because uh, actually the note above and below it pick, play pretty well. There might, I, I have to you know, double check, I don't have an oddball leak there. Um, but uh, that's what I want to uh, address. And then after that, I might look into uh, baffle shapes and, and chamber shapes and uh, see if that you know, makes a significant difference, whether or not I'm, I'm happy with this from a sound-wise and response-wise. If I'm not happy with the uh, uh, response, I'll mess with the facing. If I'm not happy with the uh, sound, I'll mess with the, either the baffle or the uh, chamber uh, dimensions.